from the Dai Sabide Live Studios, it's Late Night War Game. Hey, thank you, Jay. We're back. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Adam, but you know me as the Dai Sabide. And tonight, we're doing a little differently. We have uh, given John the night off, and I have dragged PJ, kicking and screaming, to uh, sit in his place. Hi, hey, everybody. Cool PJ. Good day. <laughs> or oh, night. And then, of course, uh, tonight we are introduced by the one, the only, the amazing, the beautiful, the, the also bearded, Clint. Woo! That's me. <laughs> <laughs> also known as Pseudonym Sir. Gentlemen, welcome. I'm glad we're, uh, we could all be here. I'm trying to do this thing with slight, you know, slightly fewer training wheels. John is just hovering in Skype watching from the from the darkness. <laughs> 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 so, uh, what are you guys drinking tonight? Why don't you go ahead and kick it off, Clint? Uh, I know everyone uh, who who knows me is going to be surprised, but uh, vanilla Coke. I got I got vanilla Coke because I'm is. an adult. <laughs> hey, you know what? You're an adult. You can drink what you want. How about you, PJ? I am a fancy bitch. So, Cuba Libre time. Ooh, there you go. Well, I am I'm not drinking soda, but uh, I am enjoying a delicious Delirium Tremens. Ooh. Which, so last week I tried the, what was it, like raspberry and elderberry or something like that. Um, and it was a bit, it was kind of syrupy. You know, it tastes a little bit like Robitussin beer. And I, I didn't love that, which is, I was surprised because I really like Delirium's beers. So I had to go back to their uh, to the staple of del the Delirium Tremens, which is the the most like if you looked up Belgian beer in a dictionary, it would taste like this. <laughs> I think I think that works. We'll call it. <laughs> Gentlemen, cheers. Slancha. Oh, holy cow! Yeah, let's get this party started with some. News, which means I have to push another button I wasn't prepared for. There we are! <laughs> All right, I'm getting the hang of it slowly. Um, so, yeah, we've got a bit of uh, Infinity news. First up, we've got the releases for this month with Gromaz, the Probots, the um, the Hideout HRL, the Ariadna booster pack, and the, uh, the Nomad booster pack. I was a little sad with the Ariadna Nomad booster packs. I was really hoping for a couple of new things. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I get that. The That's... remote, though, is hilarious, because it's all... <laughs> it, it reminds me of... You guys know those, like, peacock spiders that, like... Yeah. That's exactly what I think of. Or that's... Yeah, that reminds me of that. It's oh, freaking so, hilarious. Totally. Um, my The only thing I'm disappointed... Actually, I really like the models, but I'm bummed out because I made my own uh, conversion for one out of a Rudris. And it's on too big of a base. No! So, womp womp. I don't know why uh, why that is the way that is, but it is. They're gonna, it looks like they're going to be on 40 millimeter, 30 millimeter bases. The really funny thing here, though, is if you look at the picture, the whoever painted them did not align them with the vision arc. So they're both looking off to the left. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and Gromaz is awesome. I'll be picking her up, of course. Mm hmm. Next up, um, some community news. We've got Forest Dragon, who is has revealed their first release of the uh, their Lizardmen for Warmaster. And like everything they do, it's starting off looking pretty freaking rad. Oh, actually, you know what? I meant to mention for the Infinity releases. So that's the March releases. For April, we are getting a new Morat action pack. Ta -da! Ta -da! Return to Monkey. Yep. And then <laughs> Infinity Raven Eye, which I'm guessing is their new code one. No clues to what factions are in there. So the, that's exciting. And then the, the Raven Eye Officer pre order limited edition mini. And then a Tyrock event exclusive edition miniature. So that's the hunter that was uh, brought mm -hmm. in with, um, yeah, with Tag Raid. And then mm -hmm. Dire Foes Missions 10, Mission 10 Slave Trophy. So I'm sure that's going to tie into the. Uh, to Raven Eye, just like it has for the last couple. And then 
of course, the uh, IPS 13 special pack with an exclusive model for Sargosh and a Zeta. And I love me some exclusive tags. I'm glad they did. I'm hoping. Oh, now I don't know with the way it's worded because it's worded as exclusive Zeta and Sar Sargosh. So is it, are they both going to be exclusive models? Or is it going to be just an exclusive Zeta and then they're just going to throw a Sargosh into all of them? I would think it'd be exclusive. I mean, it is it is a price tag, so. I want them both to be. Ever since the, the old crane model was thrown in to the... Uh, oh, right. Right? Can't be too safe. But it sounds like some cool stuff either way. All right. So, yeah, Forest Dragon, also from Patreon, uh, Monstrous Makings has been back at it with some appropriately timed more at weapons, which are great. That K1 sniper is really cool. I don't necessarily love the Yaogat sniper uh, model with the huge axe, so this makes it nicer to, to if you want to pose your own. Along with, of course, the other weapons. So, yay, monstrous makings. Kind of a light news week. You know, we had we had a lot last week. Um, Long range unga bunga 3D printing is pretty awesome, so I'm okay with this. <laughs> Long range unga bunga 3D printing. Yes. All right, well, uh, with that little bit of news out of the way, let's kick it straight over to the hobby. It's hobby time! I love it every time Gene does it. It's adorable. <laughs> you so, can't not smile. Right? That's my, my hope. Uh, at least the, the grimacing and groaning will be uh, turning to <laughs> smiles with, with Gene. All right, Clint, what are you working on? Uh, Very slowly, I put together my little res yet there don't pay attention to his wings i think they're on the wrong side but uh that's where they're at now with uh, epoxy so they live there um <laughs> it's and fun. then my it's, it's alien tech my buddy got me the uh exclusive aguacil um from the paint oh set. cool little paramedic nice uh which i'm never gonna get because i spend like no money on paint i use craft paints uh yeah, yeah. So, but he didn't need the model, and he just gave it to me. So he's a homie. Scott, you're a homie. Um, and then you could see the pile of shame uh, litterings in the background. What's in the uh, oh. pile of shame back here? Back there. Uh, that's the uh, nomad half of um. Uh, what was it called? Cold front? No, that was way long ago. The nomad half of that one thing. Of the one thing. Uh, okay, the most recent nomad half of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got Frostbite? <laughs> Crimson Stone. Crimson Stone. Crimson Thank Stone. you, Tanako. Thank you. <laughs> Too many <Words> names. <laughs> difficult. Uh, yeah. Crimson Ice. I think that's a Mountain Dew flavor. That, is that, that another isn't that an Aristea player? <laughs> oh, shoot, it is. <laughs> Uh, right. well, well, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, so so nothing too exciting, but there it is. I like those bases. Did you print those? I designed them and printed them. Yep. Ooh. That's really cool. So Does there's a notch in there for the magnet. They have little divots in there for the magnet, and there's a very thin layer of plastic underneath because I had a problem with magnets pulling out. So oh, yeah, now yeah. they can't pull mm -hmm. out. And the uh, slot is too, so there's a friction fit. So I don't have to dick around when I'm gluing that in there. I just fill it with some epoxy and shove the little dudes in there, and it's good to go. That's really That's clever. clever. Yeah. I like that. Well, neat. All right, next up we've got PJ, who's been doing lots of things. So this is the, the, the in no particular order, because it's been loaded in the order I had them in. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Let's start off with some tables you're working on. So we're kicking off Frostgrave right here at the store uh, this month and last month. So with Frostgrave, like Infinity, you need a ton of terrain. And most people who play fantasy games don't utilize a whole lot of terrain because you have giant regiments of troops moving around. So we've had a little bit at the shop. So I've been repurposing, printing like a madman, and repairing and getting other terrain ready for us to go. That top table is my personal table. It's a lot of 3D printed mostly like tabletop ready stuff as well as a couple of uh, old old ancient forge world resin fantasy buildings like the two cottages and the stable there yeah i was gonna say i thought i recognized that stable yeah Holy and cow. then 
Yeah, it's getting there. Uh, so that's actually ready to go for the, oh God, it's the well scenario. Both of those were set up for that. And we had some folks playing that in the store today uh, and last week. And we'll have some more folks up here on Thursday. So Frostgrave has been kicking it. A lot of folks are excited about it because it gives them a chance to play with models they wouldn't otherwise use. And being miniatures agnostic, you can play with whatever you want. We have one person using nothing but the Animal Adventures animals for their war band, which is freaking that's adorable. That's awesome. <laughs> no, Frostgrave is something I've... I've always wanted to dabble with. I actually ended up picking up the, I'm blanking on the name of it now, um, but it goes tropical. Oh, Ghost Like a Pelago. Fantastic yes. set. Um, and it, it, there were there were some issues at the very beginning of, I guess, first edition of Frostgrave with some really grossly min-max uh, warbands, but from mm -hmm. my understanding that it's since mostly been resolved. Um, yeah, with each release, Joe has done a fantastic job of making the rule set tighter and tighter. So Frostgrave... Second edition utilized a bunch of the lessons learned with Ghost Archipelago and when rewriting their new rule set, as well as some from Rangers of Shadow Deep. Now, the book just came out, uh, The Silver Bayonet, which is the same idea as Frostgrave, but it's Napoleonics with weird mythological beasties and Eldritch horrors. It looks really sick. I've sold a couple copies of it already to some folks, and they're they're excited to get some stuff 3D printed for it and maybe to bash up some horrifying Napoleonic plastics. So that might be next month. We'll see. <laughs> oh, very cool. Yeah. I mean, you and I are both terrain nerds. That looks great. Thank you. And then, yeah, so here's some of them playing. You said the well? Yeah, so we got a, a few folks here at the shop playing. The, both tables are being used there. Uh, Matt, the guy on the right there, is one of the members here at the shop. Uh, he decided it'd be freaking hilarious, and I love it. He took his Blood Bowl team and made it his Frostgrave uh, warband, <laughs> and the idea is that uh, during the offseason, what are you going to do? You know, might as well go spelunking in the frozen city for magic treasures. So his his ranged marksman is the thrower. His uh, linemen are his grunts. It, freaking hilarious. I love it. That's fantastic. And then just some little details here of the buildings you're working on. Yeah, so the, like the little treasure chest, you, you need a lot of treasure chests for this game. Uh, mm -hmm. They're like the objective tokens. Uh, we I 3D printed a bunch of those off from Darkest Desire from My Mini Factory, who has a fantastic uh, tribe on there with uh, various furniture and interior pieces and treasure, all pre-supported. And the pre-supported files actually work. I don't have to mess with them, which is what? magic for me. Right? So well, it looks fantastic, I've, I've been printing man. those up to use in the store. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then next up, oh, here we go. We've got some more uh, 3D printed buildings of yours. Yeah, we're going to get those painted up eventually. We got uh, the folks here, the, the heavy gear community has been chugging along, painting their stuff, painting it faster than I can paint the terrain, which is a problem. So I need to get cracking on that, get the airbrush out. But uh, recently they've discovered the love of infantry and in this particular game, the love of infantry while stationed inside of a blockbuster and how impossible they are to kill. <laughs> <laughs> Defend the VHS tapes on Terra Nova. Right, right. From the dingo with the Pokemon uh, parachute in the back. Well, it looks like a Pokeball. So uh, that, that's one of Dalton's figures. He's a fantastic guy. He won the tournament that we had last time. And he's like, it looks like a Pokeball. I can't not paint it like a Pokeball. That's, but uh, that's yeah, the infantry fantastic. murdered that dingo. That's the skull there. Oh, man. That's actually pretty rough. Like, it's one thing to get infantry out of the... Oh, because they have light... They have the light shade charges. Yes. For the engineering infantry. So if he just gets a better roll... <laughs> it's bad news to the dingo. That's funny. I love so, it. So, the meta is figuring out how to deal with infantry currently, which is adorable to watch. <laughs> um, all right, great. Well, finally, we have... Here we are. Some oh. Other. Yeah, stuff I'm working on. Yeah. So, I mean, it'd be rude if I didn't play in the Frostgrave campaign. So I've, I've been working on some models. Uh, the top three there, I've got some Kingdom Death models. I did some light conversions on the one in the middle of the witch. And she's my wizard. Uh, counts, you know, she's a witch in Frostgrave and in the, her apprentice. Uh, threw on one of the Reaper cats licking its butt since it's a witch. They need a cat. Makes sense. You know, keep it yeah. silly. Got another Reaper model there for the Thief. These are all just airbrushed mostly with Pro Acryl paints. So there's very little actual brushwork on most of these. Um, nice. The abs on the apprentice on the right there, um, she, which I want to say is the Preacher model from Kingdom Death. Mm -hmm. I did I did brushwork on her abs there, but everything else is almost entirely just the airbrush with the Pro Acryl and then touching up with brushes I go. And in the bottom, we've got some 
Cat, some Cadwallon miniatures from uh, Confrontation. And I, the two... I see some Confrontation here. Yeah, and then the two in the middle are actually from Signum Games, which is one of our commercial licenses that I 3D printed here in the shop. Oh, very Which cool. are heavily inspired by Confrontation. Yeah, I was going to say, they, they, those two, like, they're obviously, they're not, uh, just only because, like, that catalog is old enough that I still remember it all. Um, but, like, they, they fit in perfectly. Oh, yeah. We, uh, we, we actually have a pretty strong confrontation community here in Houston, which is mind-boggling to me that it's still a thing. And I love it because I have a huge collection. But, uh, yeah, the Legends of Signum line of STLs has been very popular here. We sell quite a few each month. I think the Midnor Dwarves are one of the nicest lines of models still ever made. Those dwarves are dynamite. They're so cool. <laughs> All right. Um, well, cool. So I've been working on a couple things. Uh, first up, I've been assembling models from uh, from War Cradle, right? Some dystopian wars, and these are the uh, British support sprue, basically one sprue worth of them. Uh, it took me a while to figure out how I want to arm them. <laughs> Um, instead of magnetizing everything, which I just don't have the patience to do anymore. But mm -hmm. they're pretty gorgeous models. Um, all of their plastics are really high quality. It's really nice stuff. I was pretty pleased with, with how well it all went together. Those look really sharp. I haven't seen the British stuff in person yet. Yeah, they're they're really sharp. Uh, I mean, like they've got like the individual planks on the deck detailed in the plastic, um, which takes up the paint really nicely. Mm-hmm. So yeah, cranked out some of them, um, and then I got to work on my my didn't know I was gonna do it or kind of urban table for heavy gear. So these are a bunch of uh, Outland models, uh, N scale. I think meant for train, but work perfectly for heavy gear buildings. And then I got some of these twenty eight millimeter scale MDF roads that I'm actually just dividing up each lane down the middle with some paint. To make it into a two lane or four total lanes for the road to scale it down to roughly 12 millimeter that looks amazing i'm going to shamelessly steal your idea yeah, shamelessly dude, i was pretty like as i was doing it i'm like this is actually gonna work this <laughs> um, it was really easy to do and it gives me because like the problem is i was the same thing with the rivers really so i'll, I'll go go back to, to uh modifying these but the rivers are also from the same producer it's just neoprene, so I can put the roads right over the river, and you know you assume that the water level is lower than the surface of the road, and it works totally fine. Yeah. How well did the neoprene pre tank the paint? Because I see you put the new stripes down to split the roads there. Yeah, two coats and you're good. It's nice. It didn't spread out or anything. Didn't soak in. A little bit, um, but it, you don't really notice it. Yeah, I was gonna it, say I don't, I don't I don't notice it even when you zoomed in. That looks really good. Yeah, I went straight from the pot so that it wouldn't have any if, if there's too much water in it it will spread that's what mm -hmm. i've noticed so getting out like your your old thick um white paint that you know is not diluted really basically at all and it went on perfectly your solid pot of gw skull white that's yeah, just exactly. a chunk of plastic yeah yeah i had to mix it with a nail to, to start getting to move around um but it worked really well and then what i also did you can see over here is i cut some of the some of the rows in half the long ways to give myself some two lane roads to put in between the four lane roads. That's clever. I like that. Yeah, so you get a lot of mileage out. I also cut some of them the long ways, so you have short roads and long roads, um, just to give me some more variation when I'm setting up the train. And like, as far as roads go, I've been really hard to find a ten millimeter road that I like. Um, you know, there's lots of there's lots of them out there for like flames of war, but they usually like cobblestone or mud. Um, yeah, and they, they all warp. I've got a few of those here in the shop, and they don't sit flush very well, unfortunately. Yeah, you have to store them on like a flat surface, otherwise they warp while they're in storage. Um, mm -hmm. But being neoprene, these have been great, and then the rocks here are just some uh, 3D printed rocks that I had that I was using on my desert table, but I had too much train for my desert table. So I just grabbed these rocks, I hit them with a really dark brown undercoat, it's like the Krylon dark brown camo spray color. It, it looks almost like the color of your shirt, but that's just because of the distortion. Um, mm -hmm. But, and then I just zenithed it with some, I think, vermin fur from Army Painter in a rattle can, and then glued some flock onto the top of it. And that was it, three steps. I painted all, all of the train in, you know, in an hour or less. 
rocks are real nice like that. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. right. So, so far this paint, this table, I've just described 100% of my painting. <laughs> I really like the washing you did on the on the roads to show the road wear from the vehicles going up and down it. Yeah. That looks really good. That adds that, that little level of realism that makes it pop. Well, you can see the difference between, like, before and after. <laughs> yes. Um, and, yeah, like you said, it also helps visualize the four lanes a bit better. Mm -hmm. So, pretty happy with how it's coming so far. It looks really great when you actually start getting models on there. Um, and it kind of tells the story of the scale of the game a lot better. Yeah, and I mean, it's good for gameplay, too. Uh, you actually have roadways, and you're like, do I hop on the road and get the extra inch of movement, or do I ignore it entirely? And a lot of tables don't even have the road. Yeah, well, that was part of it, is that I wanted to use the road rules from Heavy Gear. Which... Mm -hmm. Wait, you wanted to use terrain rules in a Not game? Terrain. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Shit. Me neither. Yeah, right? I don't want that in the account, damn it. So, yeah, this is basically my way to try to use terrain rules that were often ignored. <laughs> Weird. Deja vu. Got them. That's funny. I hadn't even thought of that. Why do you, why so do you... for people who aren't aware, Adam throws a tournament in Infinity where he makes terrain rules slap you in the face. Yeah. God, it's so much fun to watch. The, the last Infinity tournament I did, I did something similar, and there was a lot of grumbling. Yeah, you, you know, you have to get people out of their comfort zone. That's what, yeah. that's what I think. Well, especially within 4, a lot of the folks, because of COVID, just didn't have the practice. So they're, they're like, there's no cover on this table. It's like, there's literally cover cover everywhere. Right? You just gotta and, use it. Yeah. <laughs> it's there. All right, cool. Well, uh, with all that hobby out of the way, that means it is time for our... Oh, crud, I forgot to do... The uh, the thing. What just happened there? Figuring things out. Um, yeah, there's going to be a giveaway. I'm going to do it a little bit later when I remember how to. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Yeah, right? Like, son of a biscuit. Totally forgot what John did to do that thing. Maybe he'll post it in chat. Maybe he'll message it to me. Um that's hilarious. <laughs> like, I, I was feeling pretty confident right up until then. Uh, <laughs> tactical sticky note. You need a tactical sticky note. Yeah, exactly. Uh. <laughs> well, that's okay. We're all learning here. Um, oh, look, he's actually typing with me right now. So this little bit of stalling is... He's pretty much the best. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> he's, he's probably just like laughing and cackling over there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, cool. Here we are. Okay. We're going to say the magic word that, that that Clint was preparing this whole time while I was stalling for him because I didn't want him to be embarrassed. I thought I would take that uh, for Oh, him. thanks. Thanks. That's appreciated. Yeah, no worries, man. Um, what would you like the word of the night to be? Rules. Rules. All right, guys. Go ahead and type rules into the chat. And yeah, face palms are good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, <sighs> that is too freaking funny. Yeah, it's so appropriate. All right, in a couple seconds here, I'll go ahead and uh, hit the button and announce who our winner is for our weekly contest. But yeah, so every week. Mythic Games provides one of our lucky listeners with $10 in credit from moe-games.com. All you have to do is join us in the chat and do the thing the other people are doing, which is type the word rules in, and uh, then I push the button like so, and I thought I did it. There we go. Yay. Yeah, you did. Yay. Tanako oh. Skyler won. Oh, Yay. Right. Congratulations, Tanako Skyler, and thank you, uh, Mythic Games, for, of course, for your sponsorship. <laughs> And thank you, everybody who's listening, for bearing with me while I figure out what, what the heck I am doing. All right. For the podcast listeners, this is probably not the most exciting section. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, now would be the time to leave us the Google reviews, please. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is not the time to do that. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and shoot you a message in a second here and get your information over to Ruben. All right. So with that... 
Without further delay, it's time for the main event. It is time to talk about all the things. So here we are. Clint, you are back to get us get us back to tell us all the things about how to do all the things with the new rules, which are very confusing at first. Yeah, so I've got a list here of all the the fact changes which uh, are in an order from uh, least exciting to most exciting as judged by me, by myself, and uh, it's probably wrong, but that's okay. Uh, so yeah, we, we got some basic stuff that I didn't even know were questions. Right. Um, for example, is it possible to use speculative attack while making a BS attack? The answer is no. I didn't even know that was possible before this question to have both of those things. Right. So, so things that are uh, that are apparently frequently asked enough, yet in years of playing this game have never come up. Yeah. So your tractor mules can no longer, if you were previously uh, combining those two things. <laughs> tractor mules getting grenades out of a panoply? The tra tractor mules would have been able to do it natively. Um because they have guided and uh, uh, spec attack on their weapons. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But they're the only thing in the game that has it natively. It was a possibility if you had someone who had guided go and get grenades from a panoply, uh, is what that note meant. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, so not super huge uh, world-breaking things there. Um, they clarified that if you have multiple ch troopers with surprise attack uh, attacking uh, at the same time with the coordinated order or what have you, uh, the mods do not stack. Um, sure. So that I don't think that surprises anybody as a take you could take, but it is good they clarified that. Yeah, um, I think that was actually a conversation I remember happen having towards the beginning of the edition. Actually, was specifically people... Um, Surprise attacking with multiple models in a coordinated order, like neg twelve, someone. Right, right. Yeah. So I'm glad that they've uh, at least put the nail in the coffin of something that should have been dead from inception. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. Their their mods section in the book is a little sparse. They're yeah. like, it just gives minuses and stuff. Okay, next. Um, Another thing I didn't know was a question is, do impetuous activations generate arrows? Yes, they do. If you run out in front of a sniper with your impetuous uh, phase order, uh, you get shot. That's... Don't do that. That, that, Our... was, that was way, yeah. All right, guess... Galvin. Yeah, right. Um... So that was... And then we have... Yeah, no, just yeah, just some of these really are the kind of like you said, the kind of questions that I feel like maybe maybe it's, it's honestly maybe it's not there for us. Maybe it's there for newer players that think mm -hmm. they're like getting one over on their friend. Like it's you know, it's the impetuous phase. It's not the regular phase or whatever kind of nonsense argument they have. And then... I mean the the argument there was that the impetuous section didn't say that they spent an order. They just activated, and the ARO section said something about orders. So it was kind of, if you're, like, reading it raw and you don't have context, it, it could be a question, but I, I I don't feel like any tournament organizer read that and was like, oh, you know? Right, right. Um, and then we've got, if a tag is in a fire team and the tag's pilot dismounts, or mounts is it a member of the fire team the answer is yes um but this is what i thought was interesting the next question i have is if they if if it's a remote pilot and you reset the tag in order to get the pilot back yep. in the tag that bumps them from the fire team oh interesting oh that is interesting so that still... kind of hmm? go ahead it felt kind of arbitrary when I read it. Like, wh why? Why is that different? But, but it is. It is how it is. Yeah, it's not entirely intuitive with the other ruling, but okay. Right. 
Yeah, I wonder if there's some edge case that, which is why that even came up to begin with. Mm-hmm. That we're not thinking of and maintaining your maintaining your fire team during that would be not good. I don't know. I'm trying. Yeah, it's it's rare enough to have an attack in a fire team. <laughs> Much less one with a pilot remote that then goes out and then you re. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a very edge case to begin with, so I don't know. I don't know if there's what's a, a what's a linkable tag with a remote pilot. I <laughs> dude, I don't know. Like I'm trying to think. Know. Like, are any of the pano tags linkable? Oh no, I guess the uh, the the combined ones, zero drop. Yeah, that's it. thank you, Taco. Yeah. Um, right. Okay, so that's those. I lost my spot here. What happens? If uh, oh okay, so uh, if you have uh, peripheral control, uh, <laughs> thanks for highlighting that. Uh, You're and it dies or enters another null state. Um, what happens to that control unit? Uh, and you just immediately designate it a new spearhead. This is technically different from what they had written. Um, but I think very few people would have caught that, uh, uh, Lobo being one of them. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> cause, cause he was telling me that if you shoot the spearhead, you get like a free order cause you have to reform the what? control unit. But yeah, no, your, your spearhead just moves. That's it's fine. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. It does make basically uh, mean that, that, you know, like, um, uh, the, the, was it the pup? The ta uh, pup tactica, puppet tactica, the puppet bots, yeah. The puppet bots are—they're a little bit robust of their little fire team. Yeah, but they don't yeah, use blink bonuses anymore, so it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. All right. Does discover benefit from target state? Yes. Yep. Yep. Um. If a trooper with camouflage one use, I don't know why I said it like that. Camouflage, it's two words now. Uh, deploys as a model, can it use the camouflage state during the game? Um, and does this change if the trooper fails an infiltration roll? Um, so this is this is something I've been saying kind of since the beginning. Um, camouflage one use means one use. So if you do it during deployment, that's you using it. Uh, if you don't use it during deployment, you can use it later. You could go into camo state once. Um, that's kind of handy. You could yeah. think of some tricks for that. Uh, yeah, I was talking with, to John about this, actually, with his Bruant when uh, he yes. was putting it in a fire team. Mm -hmm. So you just put Bruant in a fire team without camo state, and then when he's on his own later, you put him into camo and enjoy that. Um, I love Buran. <laughs> He's so good. See, that's that's a model that I'm, I'm tempted to like commission somebody to resculpt to look just like Leon the Professional. So the Molotov. For sure. That that would be pretty sick. Molotov on one hand, holding the pot and plant in the other. I like mm -hmm. that. Um. Oh, also, if you try and infiltrate, if you roll to infiltrate past the halfway line. Uh, and you tried to do it in camo, that would use your usage if you failed. Um, okay, so that's that one. Uh, using super jump. This, this one, I don't even know why this is a question. If move plus jump is declared, could the trooper use the first value of their move attribute for all skills? No. It just has to do with the, with like the silly wording that they use to describe using jump as a single... Like, single... Uh, single short oh, skill. Oh, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. sure, yeah, it, sure. It just has to do with with the 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 wording that they used for that. So people were because it was basically like you use the full value of your move. Um, mm -hmm. And because normally it's a full skill and it uses the the first one, it just assumed all the time you're using the first one in the writing of it. So it's a it's a silly thing that I, I don't think i ever saw anyone really try but it was it was there that's fair that's fair Whew. we're almost through the small changes uh does an unconscious trooper prevent an enemy from re-entering marker state or cancel their <laughs> cautious movement uh 
Uh, no, they are in an all state. Uh, they don't get what? they don't get to do anything. What if they are unconscious but their eyes are still open? Uh, oh well, in that case, no, no, they can't. <laughs> is that, no, does that not work? <laughs> That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Yeah, I mean, some of these definitely sound like again like like somebody thought they had some sort of cool edgy trick of the rules that I'm going to get my opponent with. They're not going to see it coming. Yeah. Well, actually, the seed embryo is not unconscious in the fluff, but... Yeah, but... <laughs> it's a new conscious that is spawning out of the organs of the, what's left of the, the viscera of the previous one. So the, the spawn is actually totally aware and alert of what's happening around it. <laughs> has a little tiny, like, CB radio inside of its eggs. It's tuning the <laughs> Brick War 90 copy. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, the next one is in the hacking arrows section. I'm not going to read it word for word. It's like a paragraph. Um, but they changed the active trooper, reactive trooper roles in that paragraph, which on, which changes the um, arrow to depending on whether the reactive trooper is the hacker as opposed to the active one. So if someone's walking through a repeater, the reactive hackers are the ones who get the arrows, not everybody if the active hacker. So yeah, yeah. it's just, it's works the way you think it would, but their example was, or their, their phrasing was backwards. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And then, and then this is the smallest change of all. Uh, <laughs> visibility condition affects bullet one. It's 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 character for character the same words. I do not know uh, <laughs> what changed. What changed? Yeah, any just whatever that is. Uh, I might be missing so, something. So it's but... any special skill or piece of equipment that requires line of fire, except dodge, and is performed into through or from into or through a visibility zone suffers a mod uh, to the relevant attribute that is required for the role. I think it's the same thing. God damn it, Rimdog. They call me Christopher Walken from the way I say camouflage. <laughs> 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 well, oh, God, that was terrible. I'll stop now. Yeah, uh, never do that again. Um, okay. So, yeah, that sounds the same. If somebody can tell us the difference, maybe something wasn't capitalized before. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Is it the same font? Right. I mean, yeah, commas are in the wrong place. But. Uh, no difference. You don't need to know that one. Okay, and then uh, BS attack requirements. Um, this one took me a second to figure out what they were getting at and actually confused me when it first came out. It's be able to draw line of fire to the target of the BS attack in the location you are attacking. It's the change. Um, so I thought this was doing the opposite of what I'm going to talk about later. Um, but what it's doing is preventing you from shooting through walls. Uh, because before, you just needed a line of fire to shoot. So if I, if I was if I'm behind a wall yes. and I come out, I have line of fire and I go back, I can shoot you now from any point along my thing, including behind the oh. wall. So they, they're, uh, they're clearing, yeah. clarifying that. Is what I think that they're okay. trying to clarify okay. there. <sighs> okay. okay. Uh, look out. Uh, players will check the requirements of the skill when declaring it. Um, this isn't so much as a, a change from the way it was as... Um, sorry, this wasn't a change from the way people were playing it, I don't think, as clarifying that it's one of those things that you have to check the requirements when declaring yeah. as opposed to resolving. I see. Um, and then Symbiomates got updated. Uh, uh, they changed the language to require a saving role instead of being attacked. The only thing that qualifies for, I think, is Spotlight. Um, so Spotlight doesn't pop your Symbiomates, which they clarified before, but they just sure. changed the word. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it, 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 yeah, it's just saying it, it's making it work the way you expect it to work. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And also, uh, symbiomates don't have immunity total versus comms attacks, which shouldn't matter if they do because immunity total specifically says it doesn't work versus comms attacks, but they're being extra clear, and I will not fault them for that. <laughs> okay, so those, these are all the, the really minor kind of changes that that are probably the way people were playing already, um, except for maybe clarifying a couple gotcha moments. But... Mm -hmm. Otherwise, nothing, uh, nothing terribly uh, exciting, right? Right. So what's, uh, what's and then medium? Uh, my, my medium changes. Okay, so can a pilot use the tactical awareness or lieutenant order generated by a tag profile? Uh, and they say no, huh. because the pilot doesn't have that skill, tactical awareness or lieutenant, so it can't be activated with the order. Um, this is definitely something I would be playing differently if this wasn't in there. Yeah, there's like some quantum yeah. order declaration happening here. Right? So like by, by declaring the... Because you declare the use of the order before you declare the use of the skills. Yeah. Right, so if they dismount, which happens at the beginning of the order, but you have to spend the order... Huh. It's it's quite clear the pilot can't use that order. So yeah, you, you, there are there are better ways to to write that. Yeah, I, it's, it's simply just saying like the it cannot be used to mount or dismount the tag. Right, like something. That or even like, when the pilot's by itself, I yeah. think is what this one's making yeah. clear. Like I mean, I think the intention is the intention there is clear. It does just get funny because it means that. If you use the wrong order, you can not do the skill that you want to do. Right. But it also means that don't save your tactical order for last if your if your last turn gambit is to get out of the tag. True facts. Yeah. Um this one, this next one I thought was good. So what happens when you pop out of hidden hidden deployment? Um and uh, uh, someone's occupying your spot, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't touch the person. Is you're as close as you come out as close as possible to the original position, but never in silhouette contact, even in ARO. Uh, this is good. This wasn't touched at all mm -hmm. in the rules before. Yeah. Um, this is how it worked in N3. So I think a lot of people were playing it this way. Um, but yeah, it's good that it's clarified. I mean, to be fair, it would be really fun if they let you be in base contact. <laughs> like, if you just roll up, at least get, you know, give the give the option, right? Sure. If, if you're just standing there and suddenly the wall like grabs you and cuts your neck, <laughs> like, <laughs> like what, what are the odds that that ever actually happens? Like, so give them a little something when it does happen. But I, I think for um, for for brevity and clarity. It, it's nice that it's crystal clear. I just, yeah, I just like to see, just give a little something. It just, it never happens. It never happens. <laughs> it never happens. Oh, man. Um, so, yeah, that's good. Uh, when a trooper uses, okay, so this one's got people uh, 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 rioting, right? So, when a tro <laughs> trooper uses mine layer, do you have to check if the deployable equipment or weapon is inside their zone of control? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you must measure during the trooper's deployment before placing the deployable equipment or weapon. And now we're going to get into uh, some FAC 1.2.1. Uh, <laughs> there was there was some forum discussion uh, between Helois and uh, IJW clarifying that you can measure from the mine or the mine layer. It doesn't matter which. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so you're not saying this one's the mine layer first. Um, but honestly, uh, the this this needs to be in the rules that you have to measure this because they're supposed to be within eight inches. But if you're never allowed to measure that, then... But I thought you could measure during deployment. Uh, the only zone of control measurements you get during deployment are from being in a fire team. Mm -hmm. Really? 
I thought you could just ar which, arbitrarily measure during the which I th I I think that's the way it should be to solve the biggest issues with this. Yeah. Um, but the reason I don't think this is a a major issue, the reason I have this in a medium column, is because how much measuring that's required in the game that people skip like yeah how many people measure their fire team when they're like grouped in a clump um if someone was like did you measure all your mine layer stuff i would be like technically no right. so so yeah this if someone is being a hard ass about the rules here you would have to measure your mine layers, including if they're in um, hidden deployment. Huh. So that's kind of where most people are, are losing their shit is, you know, you're revealing that there's a mine and a mine layer. Um, but I, I think it's going to be more of a non-issue. I think people are just going to, have people turn around when they measure or or something like that um yeah that's interesting it yeah to me the bigger issue is definitely with hidden deployment mm -hmm. it's like well i yeah. just need to check the zone of control this camo marker here i'm not normally allowed to check zone of control models during deployment but no reason uh <laughs> hmm. okay uh but yeah that's a that's a little weird. I can see why. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know if I would like start lighting my army on fire, right? But yeah. Um, I can see that it, being a little annoying. It messes I, the shell game a little bit. Right, but I yeah. I honestly don't think that's the intent. I think the intent is to be like you get to measure this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it, there's a measure required just in the fact that it has to be in your zone of control. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the way I see it, and I expect their clarifications to go along those lines. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, Helois is is out of commission currently. Right, with uh, the, like a herniated disc or something. Ugh. Uh, his spine exploded, as far as I know, and yeah. I I hope he takes the time to get better and doesn't feel pressured at all from anybody on the forums or elsewhere. Well, I mean, what uh, a trooper for even responding then with a herniated disc. I mean, that, that's, I've had that. It sucks. Yeah, that's like, I read that and I was like, oh no, go go to sleep. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, yeah. we're fine we with our toy soldiers. You could, you could just, just chill. Just chill. All um, right, cool. So let's, let's move on to the next one here. Uh, ba -bum -bum -bum. Okay, so they clarified something. So these next two go together. Uh, they replace before in 1.1. 1. 1. 1. Uh, they had do pilots or operators count towards dominating a zone of operations? Uh, and they said no. Uh, now they've split that into two parts. Uh, the first one being do pilots or remote pilots count towards dominating a zone of control? Or sorry, a, a zone. Yeah. Uh, the answer is no, they don't. Uh, but do iguana and anaconda operators? Uh, they clarified how they interact with army points, victory points, and dominating zones. Um, so long story, a little shorter. The operators count for the points. Um, the the tag doesn't count as killed until the operator is killed. And that's that's um, basically how it worked counted in N three as well. Yeah. Did the pilots not count towards uh, the zones? Pilots did and... not count. Okay. So basically, pilot, pilot, basically, pilots were zero points. Operators were all of the points, and the tags were zero. It seems to, interesting. It, yeah. It seems to more or less work the same way now. Yep. It's that has always, to me, though, been one of those things like a pointless differentiation between the two. But the there. biggest difference being that you can get out of a unconscious tag with a pilot. Whereas that's not an option for the operators. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, both of the tags with operators, you know, detonated after they went unconscious. 
And then you're left with a uh, girl with a Spitfire <laughs> in the case of Anaconda, or or another heavy infantry in the case of the uh, the the iguana. So yeah, cool. It's crystal clear now. Pilots are worth are worthless. Nobody cares about the pilot, but everybody cares about the operator. Uh, and then we have how does super jump work when activating multiple troopers, and not all of them have super jump. Uh, this basically lets you declare a short skill jump, allow the troopers that don't have super jump to idle, the super jump troopers to jump, and then be able to declare a second short skill. Um, yeah, that is that is rough to mix links yeah. with super jump. So this this is kind of a this is kind of how I always thought it was played, but it's a it's a good clarification, um, and I've seen lots of people ask questions about this. Sure, I mean I've seen plenty of people play where you know the the super jumpy models jump while the other guys move, right? That I think is a common misplay. Um, oh, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm just moving my guys. It's like yeah, but the way you move them actually matters in this one particular instance. Yep, yep, yep. Um, bu -bum. Okay, so those that's it for my quote-unquote medium changes. And then there's two big changes. The biggies. Oh. <laughs> uh, let's get with the one that's caused less people uh, issues, which is the uh, zero visibility zone change. Um, so... They changed it to basically any troopers who is the target of a BS attack into, through, or out of a zero visibility zone treats the visibility zone as a poor visibility zone when drawing line of fire to the attacker. Okay. So this is a huge buff to MSV1. Right. Mm -hmm. So MSV1s, if they are... So I think the way it works out is if I shoot you through the smoke with my MSV1... And you shoot me back, I'm now the target of a BS attack, and therefore I treat the zero viz as a poor viz. Yes. So my penalty goes from negative six to negative three. Right. So it's only if the MSV1 guy gets targeted by a BS attack. Yeah. Anything else, he'll still have that minus six. Um, yeah, so but... if I shoot you and you dodge, I'm still at negative six. Right. Um, and how does this work with um, with white noise? Right, right. <laughs> uh, so IJW's posts um, clarified that white noise doesn't get to see through, or MSV doesn't get to see through white noise. Um, what was his exact words here? Uh, like Multispectral visor troopers that are shot through a white noise zone cannot reduce the mods. Of the resulting poor visibility okay. zone. So if if I am a non MSV troop, you are an MSV troop. I shoot you through white noise. You don't suddenly get to be like, haha, you've fallen for my trap card, and this is now <laughs> this is no longer a zero viz zone, but a poor viz zone. And I'm yeah, I'm MSV two, and I reduce poor viz to no viz mod. I have seen through your white noise. E H M G. That doesn't happen. So white noise is still uh, useful and works uh, but, as it did before. Okay, because I think I think with this FAQ drop, that was like the first thing I I saw, and I was just like, uh, teacher. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, like, so you guys were doing that before? What? <laughs> yeah. Does, does this mean what I think it means? And the answer is no. Shut up. Go back to the back of the class. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm glad, right. I'm glad that white noise continues to work as uh, as it should. Um, but yeah, this is a big deal for the MSV1 troops. It, I'm thinking about that already with my Ariadna being like, yes, oh, yes. we're relevant. <laughs> right? Yeah, who needs more than MSV1? <laughs> All right. Uh, so now we get into, I, I paired, I combined a lot of the questions into this one Um the, the next three things I'm going to – we're going to talk about for a minute because there's a lot going on here. Okay, so the big thing is if the target is in total cover, the attacker may not perform 
a BS attack with blah, 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 blah. It used to say declare. It now says perform. This brings a BS attack into line with their last FAQ with their uh, 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 preemptive declarations. So you can be behind a wall and say, I'm going to shoot your dude and then come out of the wall and shoot their dude. Okay, so you can still declare you can't perform. Right. That, thank, if you're... Yeah, thank God. Um, so really quickly, you've prepared some visual demos for this next part. Should I uh, switch it on over? Uh, I'm, I'm going to read the next two, and then we could get to okay, the, okay, the okay. little thing. Well, then we can see um, it in practice. Right. So, so we're going to talk about all three of these at once, um, but I just wanted to say them. Okay. So the next question is how are direct templates placed during the order expenditure sequence? Uh, they're placed during declaration. So a clarification that's in that IJW post is your target doesn't have to be legal for your during declaration uh, placement of the templates. We'll talk about that in a second. And uh, impact templates are are the same. Um, Say what? So so, temp so templates have to be placed during declaration. Can you walk around a template? Yes. So that's that's going to be that's that's one of the issues. So let's let's get looking at stuff. I got uh, this is a Y rock no die map. Thanks Y rock for all your lovely maps. I got some 3D miniatures that Vol SC had a big hand in getting organized. Thanks, Vol SC. I think I saw him in the chat earlier. Hi. Um, and he's AFK. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so let's just go through a little scenario real quick to kind of um, illustrate what's going on. We have Fusilier uh, uh, Angus over here, right? It's his turn. He declares shoot at this Morlock, right? So the Morlock can declare that he's going to put a chain rifle down, but he has to pick where it goes. Um, and they can't see each other, right? There are these boxes in the way. Um, he could put okay. it over here. He could put it over. Whoop, he could put it don't over put here. Don't put it down there. <laughs> yeah, don't don't put it don't put it this way. That's not going to help you. That's a bad idea. Okay. <laughs> so you can you can place it, however. Right. Now the fusilier gets to go. Um, you, if he comes around this way, your template is null and void. The target of your attack is not in it, and he gets to shoot you for free. Oh. Huh. I don't like it. A lot of people don't like it. I think it's f fine. It's it's a little unintuitive. It makes direct templates not great. I don't think it breaks the game like some of the internet is claiming. Um, but yeah, so what you should do instead with your Morlock is pistol or assault pistol or whatever they've got. Right. So this, or dodge. This is actually going to in a way actually make uh boarding shotgun armed warbands more relevant right right because in this case you just declare bs attack the boarding shotgun right and let them right. like cool which corner do you want to come around i'm at plus six right it's it, there's gonna be a little bit less peace trading um but that is that is a big difference yeah, so, uh, I mean, what's important is the way people, or not what's important, what, what, what's a point I haven't been hearing a lot is the way it was played before this, right? Uh, Fusilier couldn't declare he shot at you, but let's say he, um, let's say he was better at CC and declared CC attack. Yeah, uh, right. The only option for the Morlock was dodge um, or reset, but... We're not talking about that right now. Yeah. Um, even if there was one, only one avenue of attack, he would get that CC uh, for free. Oh, he could have, he could have CC'd back. Yeah, that's he, that's my. Yeah, he's yeah. Don't go, don't go CC the Morlock. 
Yeah, let's just pretend it's the other way around then. The more likes attacking the <laughs> fusilier. Um, but now the fusilier can shoot back an arrow. Yeah, they can uh, do their shoot. Right. And this is a this is a mildly contrived situation here, right? I've got two guys, and he's able to shoot from two different points that you can't cover with you can't cover both with a template. Yeah. I, I think that's going to come up a lot less often than dude bro being in a corner like this and Fusilier being over here. Fusilier declares shoot. You put your template here. If he wants to shoot you, he's got to come across the template. Right? Yep, yep. I mean, so here's the thing. Like, with kind of with the proliferation of templates, because they got added, you know, they got added shotguns, right? So then, mm -hmm. like at the, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the edition, everybody is complaining that like templates are everywhere. So I'm actually kind of fine with this mechanically because it's consistent. It's consistent with the mechanics of the rules, and it actually takes <laughs> templates down a little bit of a notch, so people can <laughs> like <laughs> you can think back to remember whenever you know when, whenever I was complaining about it. Okay, fine. We'll we'll do you'll know, take them down a notch. Well, I didn't mean like that. You know, <laughs> you know? Like, now, now you'll actually use the the uh, direct shot of your boarding shotgun. So, <laughs> how do you think this is going to affect warbands as, as a choice to go into table I just now? Though, I that's the thing is like I'm actually okay with warbands not being guards. That's not mm -hmm. that's not what a warband. That's not really what they're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. they're supposed to sort of like run up there like maniacs. Like they're they're not. They're not intended, at least from the way it's presented. Um, I don't believe that they're intended to be defensive backfield guardians. They're intended to be the, the raving lunatics that go running across the table and cost six points. Um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, I think the main takeaway is don't put your direct template dudes somewhere they can get assaulted from two angles of attack easily. Yeah. Um, like, step one, don't do that. <laughs> Doctor, hurts what, whatever I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great okay no, so that's example one we ready for example two with craziness yeah yeah so i mean yeah right really quickly right now i don't hate this example i think it's fine you have to learn slightly different um rules and then and then that's it I really like that they brought BS Attack back into the fold because it seemed clear to me that the um, total cover part, which is all that was preventing BS Attacks from being declared preemptively, uh, was a miss. They missed that. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that since since 1.1 dropped and people brought it up. Um, so now BS Attack works like close combat attack, more like close combat attack. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so okay, now okay when... Now, what show, was that? I'm okay with it. Now show me the real rage. Okay, so it's the Nomad's turn, right? They're upset. I'm that already mad. The... <laughs> <laughs> uh, nomad, only happy. Uh, the Nomads are going after... Uh, the orc with their uh, uh, Uberfall commandos, right? Um, they declare CC attack from behind this wall, and the orc puts a template down. Uh, when you declare a BS attack, you have to pick a main target. Um, that That is clear in IJW's update. Um, also, direct... So I'm just going to read his update that's relevant here. The direct template weapons are left on the game table until resolution, and then you check if the main target is in the area of effect. So whenever you do a BS oh. attack, you have to declare a target. Um, so these guys all declare they're punching you in the face. Uh, the orc says, I'm going to shoot the chimera with my template. Uh, actually, it doesn't matter if it's the template. It could be the hit mode. He's got the boarding shotgun right yeah. so he's targeting the chimera the pupniks are like well okay that's not us we're gonna wreck your face 
we're just gonna we're just gonna punch you a billion times. Okay, that's so shit. <laughs> I do not approve. Oh, it's not the cat lady. Guns away. Hit me, boys. I sus- huh. I suspect that will be clarified. I yeah. I would like for I really like the template going down first. Um mainly because people don't put templates on the table enough and then I have to guts out of it and I ask them where it is and they're like, I don't know, it could have hit you. And I'm like, okay. Uh, But that's besides the point. Um, I would like if it checked at resolution that there was any valid target, Mm -hmm. any valid target for direct templates. Yeah, Um, I think this, this should be the, in my opinion, this should be the advantage of using a direct template weapon. Yeah. Especially with the other change, right? I mean, a change, a change like this breaks immersion for the game, and, and, and Infinity is such an immersive game. Yeah, I mean this, but so like, I I agree. If I were played played strictly as this as the FAQ states, and this happened, I'd be bummed. But this is this is something I feel like where it's it's pretty he it's it's big enough that i would be shocked if it wasn't clarified further i hope so i do i do hope so this is really the only problem i have with the yeah. new uh templates yeah, yeah everything else um, to me sounds like you just have to learn a slightly different way to use tools right like mm-hmm. whatever um this is the only one where you could probably use something similar i'm sure with like an auxilia or maybe the first yeah, example. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, any anything with more than one model activating at a time. Yeah. And mm-hmm. of course the the Pupnik, of course, is the most extreme example of that. Um because they're going to like wreck whatever they get into close combat with. Right. But that's when you get your uh other orc and just put more templates more now. Yeah, right. right? Problem solved. <laughs> yeah. Just more templates. Uh Oh, I can see this getting hairy with like fire teams in reaction with templates and who gets targeted who and what's not it but it. Yeah, but I mean, who knows what a fire team does anymore? <laughs> what are fire <laughs> this? What are fire teams? What I, what what M fire? All right, more, more templates, more now. Click. I want that on a shirt. Um. <laughs> Uh, I, I I would I would put it on a shirt and then also have the uh, the my name there the the thing saying it's me that said that. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, me. Uh, uh, yeah. So I could I could see why I guess I could see why people would not agree with that FAQ answer. Like that's I think that's absolutely reasonable to disagree with. Um, which also like once you actually see it in application. It's it is kind of not to the spirit of the rules enough where I would be very surprised if it wasn't addressed further. Mm-hmm. Once they are, once uh, especially once Heloise is physically able to sit down in front of a computer for any amount of time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. If you just change it to any model activated with the order, right? Like it, it doesn't. Yeah, it uh, it feels easy enough to uh, for them to adjust the wording onto. Right, and and there are other examples of this, but they just tend to be variations on these these two: avoiding the template entirely, right. or not having the target expose itself. Mm-hmm. Um, impact te- templates are less of an issue because you have to have a target when you declare it. To, 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 to deploy the circle. Right. This also um, gets like goofy with mines. Uh, mines aren't affected by this. Really? Because they don't declare arrows or targets or nothing. Oh, yeah. Oh, huh. So it's not. Weird. Mm. Yeah. So th- that to me is also more reason why I can see it changing. Just so yeah. the templates at least work consistently. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that, Clint. And the, the visuals yeah. really help here a lot. Um, yeah, the the puck that coming around the corner, 
that that's the problem. The I don't think the problem is the example that you had with the Morlock against the Fusilier on the yeah. opposite side of two crates. Like we're gonna don't use your don't use your war bands to guard things as much anymore. At least don't use them to guard narrow stacks of crates. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, I mean, I know I made a face about it, but I actually think that's better for the game. So well, yeah, that's is that's that it? all is that the I thing got. That, like, people are absolutely losing this shit over. So it's the mine layer change and the effect of preemptive attacks with regard to uh, uh, direct templates. Sure. There, there was there was an issue. Uh, before where they clarified you can you can place the template and have it not hit anybody uh so when it first dropped there was an issue with uh chimera says it's going to shoot you yeah. you don't have a legal placement at declaration because it's not hitting anybody mm -hmm. uh but they clarified you just put it down and check it's the placement's legality at the end at resolution um, so that was causing some issues early on, but yeah, just the mine layer and this, as far as I know. No, so I, what I'm hearing is I need to play more of my antipode teams. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another case of the, uh, spearhead, uh, change that oh, almost nobody's going to notice. Look at that. But yeah. You, you can hit three <laughs> FAQs in one. <laughs> yeah. I guess I feel like people need to chill out. Um, but if you missed all the drama that's been happening, uh, unfolding over Facebook and the forums lately uh, regarding this FAQ, there it is. People be sad that they got to learn the rules, um, <laughs> at least for, <laughs> for for a big part of it. And then, of course, like I said, this part I, I disagree with, but I'd also be shocked if it is not changed. Yeah. I think my biggest problem with it is it's you have to go into the forum to find the post to know how it's supposed yeah, to play like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the FAQ 1.2.1 being on the forums. I'm I'm sure they'll fix it. I'm sure everything's fine. Heloise get better. Don't mm -hmm. worry about it. We're going to play some games and it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, if you made it to the FAQ, it, you're only like one click away from the forums anyways. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Although I don't generally recommend going there under most circumstances, so I can see why you might miss it. That's what I was implying. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. Thank you so much for uh, for walking us through that. It's, yeah, the, the FAQ was kind of daunting at first when it came out, um, but I think that you know, much like m what my plan was, like, cool, everybody's freaking out. I'm going to wait a minute until something happens and then people stop freaking out as much and then pay attention to the FAQ. Right? So uh, I really appreciate you coming on to mm -hmm. to give us the fact to to fact us with your sweet ways. <laughs> Get fact. Um, oh, D speaking of fact, D Fock uh, has an interesting question slash point. Uh, uh, if you can preemptively declare BS attack, would that work if they dodge into your line of fire? I don't believe it would, Defog. I think you still can pull the idol and then dodge uh, into... Um, because that's after dice are rolled. That's after uh, requirements are checked. <clears throat> so you could still dodge out into a objective room was his example um and not get shot at <laughs> rim dog posts an amazing meme uh <laughs> that's gonna have to go up on, <laughs> on the internet later um well great so it is uh it's only 9 46 i think that PJ and I actually want to talk a little bit, and Clint, you, you, this is relevant to your interests. Um, now that we've covered the FAQ and we've got a little bit of time, we like to pad. Let's uh, let's maybe talk a little bit about getting your back to the, your back to the FLGS. Is is what I subtitled the episode. You know what we missed? What did we miss? You know what section we missed? 
games. Well, that's, that's... Any games we've played. Clint, any games we've played? <laughs> Because I was like, I got my first in-person game, like, full 300-point game in, like, months. Oh, this would have been and... awesome if you put the photos in the notes, and then we could, like, show the pictures of you playing the game on the podcast. But I don't have, I don't take pictures of Infinity <laughs> while I'm playing Infinity. <laughs> okay. Well, Ain't nobody got time for that. Tell us about your uh, your Meat Space game. Wait, wait, hold uh... a second. No, to make it, to make it official. That made it all worth it. That made it all worth it. it. It's it's great. Um, I had the weirdest game uh, versus James, uh, my buddy over here. Uh, He was bringing Vanilla Left. I was bringing Bakunin. And uh, I'll give you the quick and dirty version. Uh, his his Achilles died order one. Uh, he spent the next order one. Order his, one. His uh, Achilles died. Yes. Order one. What did you yes. do to that to that guy's poor Achilles? Those Achilles uh, went to shoot my riot girl missile launcher. No. Oh. And oh. And my riot girl missile launcher crit. And he failed all but one of the saves. That's like the the endless family guy, like, clutching the shin. Ooh. Ah, yeah. That's, that's, um, that's awful. Okay. So, so Achilles was like, let me, sh- let me show you ladies how it's done in there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then he, and then he used a bunch of orders trying to take down the riot girl with other stuff. He lost, uh. Uh, Thamelis, the weird, Thamorous. uh, the weird ODD, uh, which I'm call it. Thrasimedes. One of those two. Anyways, I'm sorry, Eudorus, Atlanta. Penith- no, 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 no. It was one of the two you said that started with the TH, and I can never get them straight. Um, <laughs> probably so, Thrasimedes. Uh, <laughs> Tim with Criticalies again died and then he started shooting with his uh mark four which is when we placed the template down and i was like oh no this template touches my lieutenant which i didn't think it did but i was wrong uh so he killed my lieutenant and achilles was his lieutenant so we both spent the very first possible loss of lieutenant turn and loss of lieutenant uh and we were playing supplies that's hilarious. He killed nothing else the rest of the game. I killed almost everything else of his, uh, but he ended up with two boxes and one. Doesn't matter what's dead if you win the game. It's true. It's true. It was just such a weird game. He was making armor saves, but not making any shots. Oh my god, there was this one point when I was shooting at his Mark IV with my uh, uh, Moira, my Moira HMG, and we were at bad range, so I was minus 12-ing him. Mm -hmm. So he was on one, (laughs) and I was on five sevens, and guess who won that shoot-off? Not the five sevens. Yeah, no, no, no. Dude, uh, it, rolling on, rolling this, on ones doesn't lower my odds to crit. <laughs> that is that is a true fact. Uh, so right before this, he's like, "I'm going to be rolling on one. I have a gut feeling. I have a gut feeling. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> shoot." And then he rolls it, like and one. he freaking explodes. He's jumping up and down and yelling, and uh, my dogs are freaking out. And it was it was good times. It was good times. That's hilarious. Nice. So yeah, final score you lost, but <laughs> <laughs> but you had the most fun, and that was final that was, score you suck. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. That was in was that in the game shop or was that? We no longer have an abode for our infinity uh, playing, so this was just at my house, which is why my dogs were freaking out. He didn't yell uh, loud enough to scare them across town. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I've been trying to get people uh, going in 
kind of kind of transitioning into that uh topic you brought up uh playing games just got just getting people playing after covid is is like pulling teeth or inertia. during covid i should say yeah inertia. yeah um, well, cool. PJ, what have you played lately? Man, I, I manage a game store. I don't get to play games. You know this. <laughs> <laughs> like, I saw um, some cool games happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I help facilitate them. So I'm hoping to get a game of Heavy Gear in this week. And if I do, we can talk about it next show. What and I you, always take pictures. Is this your, um, your, your, your Titans full of lizards while you still can? Oh, so, I mean, we, we have the tournament coming up at the end of the month, and I am sorely tempted to run dual titans full of lizards and Inkareshi, just for the lols. <laughs> what, do you, but, uh, what missions are you running for the tournament? What was that? What missions are you going to run for the tournament? Oh, uh, we just finalized those. Let me grab that real quick. Bonk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Don't for the tournament... Too. I'll, I'll get, that way I get the order of them correct, too, because we have a potential fourth mission, depending on how many people show up for the tournament. Uh, we're expecting enough that we'll have to run four rounds, but uh, better safe than sorry, you know? So. God, ba, ba, ba. Damn it, Adam. What? He's oh, fucking with my this, video. This is the OBS camera, like, made Clint move around again randomly, so I'm just... Eh fixing everything yeah um, so the missions we're running uh it's going to be three rounds with an optional fourth um if we have a large enough turnout which so far it looks like we will which is exciting that that would make it the largest in-person heavy gear tournament for 3.0 yet so uh, cool. kudos to robert he's sending me a, a, a cool trophy for this as well he always supports us so thanks to dreampod9 nice uh so for the missions round one will be seize control Round two will be coup d'etat. Round three will be prisoner exchange, my favorite. Yeah. And then round four, we'll be doing supply drop. That'll be fun. That'll be really cool. So, uh, oh, yes. Prisoner exchange seems mean. <laughs> you could say rude. That's allowed. It's Well, it just requires some special consideration when you're making your lists. And... As well as consideration for how you lay out the tables. Yeah. True, true. So I'm actually going through and doing a lot of drawing and sketching out, pulling the terrain out, making sure that there's some cool things you can do with your little camel trucks for the camp for the prisoner exchange, but uh, no situation where you can just box them in indefinitely, super easily. Um, and so this is happening where? Well, plug your store. Plug your store. Oh yes. So this will be happening at Board Brew Games here in. Humble, Texas, just on the outskirts of Houston. I mean, technically, we're in the Beltway, so. Uh, but that's down in Texas on the Gulf Coast. Shrimp and crawfish country, folks. It is a swamp, <laughs> not the desert. Not all the Texas is like that. But, yeah, that'll be here at this, the last Saturday of the month. Um, come by if you're in the area. Check it out if you want to see a whole slew of people playing heavy gear. We'll probably have 15 people here playing, yeah, maybe make, 16. Make sure to take some pictures of that. Oh, yes, we will. Uh we're all pretty excited. We're going to be doing two-hour rounds on it since we uh, are doing 125 points now, which, by the way, my community is losing their minds about the extra 25 points. Oh, my God. It's it's much better, but still capped at the three combat groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because it's better, but it's not because a lot of them are like, we're, I was really happy with my 100-point list with my infantry and such. <laughs> now I, I have 25 points, but I don't want to just dump it into upgrades on guys, but now I can't fit on my infantry. Right, it's, it's, and like I can't just like take another combat group of infantry. Problem solved. Right. Oh, especially since uh, the siege of the blockbuster incident that everybody saw. Yeah, that's hilarious. I love it. I might have to give some engineering infantry a try just because of that. Well, it, right it was on. wild. Well, right on. Uh, I was able to play a game with John. Oh, we played we played little spaceships in 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 space mecca. Um, also known as Jovian Wars. So John is still plugging away at the rules. I suspect he's probably just like endlessly rolling dice right now to figure out how things work uh, <laughs> with some changes that he has, you know, come up with during a meeting this afternoon. Um, but 
the rules of the game are, are coming along nicely. You know, he had a solid foundation when he started, and he's really done some cool uh, things to basically adapt them and make the game more playable. So we played a game with my Sega against his Venus, his Venusians, um, and they're scary. You know, uh, they've got basically their whole gimmick is they have stealth, mm -hmm. so you got to get closer to them to shoot. But then their like little mecha are absolutely like raging assholes. They're exos, and so if you get close to them, they like lightsaber your ship in half. Yeah, they've got like the Ryu, don't they? Yes, yes. So, yeah, it was it was a really interesting game. We only played I think two hundred and fifty, two hundred points. So a smaller size game, uh, really just to get venus on the table and start playing with their rules and, and seeing how they they function um they don't have a lot of firepower on the capital ships mm -hmm. but their squadrons terrify me were you guys using the drone rules so we were using his previous iteration of the drone rules actually so mm -hmm. after this john and i hung out for like two hours um reworking drones or 150 is what we played um and because john memorizes every number he's ever seen <laughs> uh, or talked about so 150 but uh, the so the, the, what we talked about afterwards was like how to make the drones more interesting because the, the drones he came up with are really cool where they're like they support your missile attacks and your other attacks but what it came down to was kind of like an activation economy issue you might run into with heavy gear um, which is like why infantry are so good right because it's not because they're, mm -hmm. they're crazy powerful it's because it takes more actions than they're worth to kill it was kind of like the inverse problem with the drones where they could juice up a missile attack, but like the amount of work it takes to leverage a missile attack to to add the drones to um, wasn't really working out. So um, through through chatting, we kind of pitched the idea of making drones, depending on their level, basically like a like a crazy koala from infinity, Ooh, right? So that's interesting. Right. So you go shoot like a level one drone across the table. The first thing that activates that drone just like flies at and blows up, right? And then when the uh, the level two drones, instead of being like little suicide missiles, um, are basically like little laser turrets. So you go shoot the drone out there, and then anytime anything activates within its range, it's going to attack it. With I think it was a, a pulse weapon. Um, so that made it a little more interesting and then the level three drones um are terrifying because they're basically a, a, a weak squadron mm -hmm. with a with a lance with like the lightsaber right and so all all that they do and if you look at the artwork all that they are is they're like little ships with claws that just like latch onto you and then like drill into you with the with the lightsaber i dig it so yeah beam projector is what we we, what we settled on for the level two drones um but yeah level so level threes are these like they're not hard to kill, but they are an investment of actions to kill. And mm -hmm. if they if they get close to you, they're just gonna like start chopping your your ship to pieces. So it's not necessarily uh, like a screening weapon. Yeah, in that case, well, so it, what what it does that's really unique is that, like most space games, you're not really playing with much terrain, if any. Mm -hmm. So board manipulation isn't really part of those games what the mod, what the what the drones do is they actually give you a level of board manipulation because you've made mm -hmm. part of the table an area where the opponent doesn't want to go to um so it's a pretty fun me mechanic obviously now we have to play that right and see how that works but it was also really just fun getting another game of jovian wars and i really like the mechanics of the game um i think we've said plenty of times I love that, it, like, rolling sixes isn't the win. It's a lot like Infinity, where all the dice faces can be relevant. Um, as Clint learned, ones in Infinity are important, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I brought my mic down specifically to make that face. Yeah, exactly. It works better with the mic down. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You could hear my disdain. Yeah. James! <laughs> so, yeah, it was... That's a awesome. Yeah, it was a really fun game with John. I mean, it's it's been you know it's been interesting watching him you know figure out how to do all the thing, you know, how to how to develop a game, 
right? Mm -hmm. um, and also interesting, the, the additional parts of the process that kind of come from uh, receiving something that's already established and then building it out into kind of something new. Yeah, I mean, I remember six, seven years ago hanging out in John's apartment in Ithaca, and like we're talking spaceships and Gundams because he like just got this Halo or Robotech box in. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and we're like, this would be so cool. We want to do the rules. We're too busy, and now he's living the dream. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's not, it's I've sold, I've thing. sold like six fleets of Jovian Wars in the store now, and people are building their ships, and they're all super excited. And I'm like, I get to play my buddy's game. This is amazing. <laughs> no, it's it's neat. It. it I have tried to play a lot of fleet games. I was a big Battlefleet Gothic nerd. Mm -hmm. um, like outside of probably Necromunda and Gorkamorker, that was probably my number one game. I had a lot of talent for Battlefleet Gothic. Oh my god, I love Battlefleet Gothic. But after playing other games since Battlefleet Gothic, they've often missed something, or they've just felt like reproductions of Battlefleet Gothic. You know, uh, Drop Fleet, aside from the mission design that I loathe. Um, the gameplay it's mechanics. so close right it's, it's so oh close. my gosh but drop fleet is written by andy chambers it's mm -hmm. written by literally written by the guy that created battlefleet gothic so the game builds a lot on battlefleet gothic though it dropped all the broadsides which still makes me sad um and the the problem is that like the it feels to me with you know a little bit of tangent with drop please that it feels like drop fleet was written to written to legitimize drop zone Right, mm -hmm. we can't have the the battles decided in space. They have to be decided on the planet. So we have to make getting onto the planet the priority of this game. So all the stuff that happens up here ultimately doesn't matter. Just like playing Infinity and not getting the supply crates. Um. <laughs> I mean, I, I get it. I think that's a cool. I, I, the, it's drop fleet is so close, so close. Okay. I just think it needs more more mechanic like more missions and scenarios sure. i mean watch the expanse i mean for real th there's so much inspiration there for why you could have a space battle not on the planet right so what's really cool about jovian wars though to tie it back to what we were talking about is that it it feels like gundam yes okay it, it in that's different where in drop fleet and battlefleet gothic um and I'm sure a myriad of other space games, like things like Ordnance, they're just counters. They don't meet the you, you, here's a token, here's a torpedo with the counts as like twelve token or twelve torpedoes. It doesn't really matter. It's yeah, like, like Babylon Five Wars. They all felt very yeah. similar in that regard. Right, and I lob my ordnance at you. You lob it at me. And what this does is it actually makes the things that would have been tokenized, um, and I mean that in the sense that re literally represented as tokens, uh, in these other games. And actually made them the more inter one of the more interesting parts of the game. Mm -hmm. um, so the ships feel like ships. They sit in the back and they kind of lob shells at each other and slowly beat each other to death. But the interesting part of the combat and a lot of the game is decided through the interactions of the individual squadrons engaging each other. And that's what's really cool. Yeah, I mean, one of the first games of Jovian we had here in the store, the fellow who was playing, he, he was getting a demo and he immediately bought all of the Jovian I had, Jovian faction I had in stock, was holy crap! This is anime space battles the game, and I love it. Yeah, yeah, it plays very much like that, which is unique. I, like I said, un it's unique in the genre. So it, it, it's really neat. I'm excited to see more folks playing it. There's been a lot of theory crafting here with the drone rules as they get changed and adapted as we have them available. So. I'm sure by this weekend, whenever I talk to the guys, when they're all in here, they're going to have some things to say if John drops the new drone stuff that he's talking about. Yeah, I'm curious when that's going to go out. I'd like to see how he kind of, um, how what he basically settled on. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's going to be neat. I want to play it. I'm, I'm building my Jovians. I have most of them built. I have a few more things to build. Are you doing, so you're going to do the Jovians? I am. Uh, I'm it, it sounds dumb, but I couldn't help it. I saw the giant spinning drum, and I went, "Ooh, spinning drum!" And I, 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 I it's all in on Jovians. They're they're so cool looking. Like I really like the Sega because Sega, mm -hmm. Sega to me aesthetically is the. It doesn't need to be pretty to fly in zero G. Yeah, yeah, I get big wing commander vibes from some of their capital ships. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, 
So that that kind of drew them to me, but like it was hard to pick them, pick between them and Jovians, just because the Jovians look straight out of out of anime. That's what you expect yes. them to look like. Yeah, and I'm I'm, I'm sitting there like all the shipping containers. I'm like, okay, how do I do little shipping container logos on this? And right, do I, I paint them all I, different colors? Right, and like again, after watching the expense, I'm like, do I put like pinup art or art on the side of the ship too? I mean, that could be fun. How crazy do I want to get with this? It's so cool. Yeah, cool models. The, mm-hmm. the Venus ships are massive. They're huge. We have a, a guy here who started putting them together, and I did not expect them to be that big, even seeing them in the packaging. Mm-hmm. All right, well, that's a little bit of a tangent. Clint, the FAQ, thank you so much for making that make sense mm-hmm. to like my my lowly mortal soul that like saw all of the bitching on the internet and was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm just going to give it a minute and let Clint lay it on me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I admit I was pretty salty, and then uh, your your examples actually help soothe the saltiness a little bit. <laughs> was, glad glad to be of service. I was like for some reason, I don't know. It's probably because I'm drunk, but I was just like, there's just like some <laughs> sort of way to like segue this into like Epsom salts and then like soaking and relaxing in the salt mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. the salt of the tears of the people. Um, salt. It's <laughs> a real salt of the earth kind of kind of. Thing you go there. Okay, I think this is this has gone on long enough. Well, you've wasted another perfectly good evening listening to late night war games. So we're not going to talk about the uh, getting folks in the game store then. Well, you know what? It's already ten o'clock. We'll save that for next time. There you go. That works. <laughs> it was it was in the uh, it was noted as if time permits. Um, so, all right. Thank you everybody for listening, and of course, go read more of our. Uh, amazing question mark content uh you can find john stuff over at bromad academy um and of course you can find our uh our stream slash podcast on youtube twitch all the podcast apps and then of course thank you everybody and all of our patreon patrons uh next week is going to be or next episode sorry in two weeks is going to be heavy gear blitz again with eden we are bringing rooster on to like lay it all down we're going to see all of the Eden stuff, all of the things that you didn't see already. Um, and there's some some big honking models that are going to be coming down the way for them that look freaking rad. So be sure we, to catch We could even this. talk about the uh, tournament after that, too. Yeah. Oh, right, right. We'll be able to cover that. Boom. Perfect. It's all, it's all coming together. And then if, I think we're also going to be announcing maybe, I don't know, it depends on how lazy I am, realistically, uh, another TTS tournament for Heavy Gear the same time so all right we'd love to give a special thanks to all of our late night war gamers over on patreon and our sponsors dream pod 9 mythic games corpus belly board and brew and brutal cities clint you got anything to plug uh my show the show i show the show on you shows. show you do, the, you do <laughs> shows i do i tim and i do the uh tabletop throwdown on sundays at sunday 10. sunday sunday Yep, Sunday uh, <laughs> at 10 a.m. And uh, we should probably be doing one this week. Uh, we didn't do one last week because of that one sports ball tournament I heard about on on Sunday. Get yeah, with the egg ball. Yeah, yeah egg ball? ball. Blood ball? Blood ball. Blood ball. Oh, blood ball, blood, blood ball thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, as... <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so uh, Sundays, 10 a.m., this very same channel, uh, we do commentated Infinity games. That's good times. Well, excellent. Go watch that thing. It's actually a really good show. It is worth the watch. Mm -hmm. Um, Tim and Clint are hilarious. All right. So be sure to catch us on Facebook, YouTube, and anywhere you get your podcast. If you enjoy the show, please take a moment to give us a five-star rating on iTunes and follow us on Twitch and YouTube. That's a long sentence. Mm-hmm. All of this will help us bring you the best content that we possibly can. And apparently that bar gets lower every week. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 no. That's not on you guys. That's on me attempting wow. to run OBS. Oh. Wow. John's gone, so the content is down. I yeah. see how it no, is. Yeah, no, it's true, I see right? how it is. Like, and... And honestly, like by next week, 
ish like it's like oh god like i need to see how many games i can get into him before he's never seen again true facts well i mean if he's got the little little ones strapped to him in the front he reaches down to move the models they're gonna help you know that's fine yeah, <laughs> yeah right that's how that works that's how that works okay all right well everybody have a lovely evening and take care bye everybody uh, 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 uh. Won't you play games with me? And I like to do everyone. That's what I like to do. That's what I like to do. That's what I really like to do. That's what I really like to do. You like to sing games? Oh, 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 oh. Won't you sing games? Oh, I love games. I love games. That's